Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. You know, over the last 30 years, the risk of dying from cancer has steadily declined, sparing some 4 million lives in the United States. And today, there are many exciting advancements in the detection and treatment of cancer. When joining me in a conversation on the state of cancer research is Dr. Bill Fentel, medical director at Korean Clinic for Oncology and faculty member at the Virginia Tech Korean School of Medicine. And thank you so much for being with me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Well, so, you know, when I was preparing for our conversation, I didn't realize, but actually, talking about cancer research, actually goes back about 250 years. But it does seem that in 2000s is where some of the real advances started coming. And then also every two or three years, really advancing even more. And so from a 30,000 foot perspective, mm. how would you characterize cancer in terms of the United States today? Any trends? So I've, I've been doing cancer care now for 40 years. Wow. And it's a long time. And, and been given talks in, in church basements and community groups for really that whole time. And the American Cancer Society statistics, I can still kind of remember them, uh, the, the causes of death and the numbers of cases were kind of always neck and neck with, with heart disease and who was the number one killer in America. It was kind of a who would want to be. But over, like you say, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, prevention, screening, therapies, the, the death rates started to do this, but the cancer incidence rates didn't stop. When I was giving this talk 25 years ago, there might have been you know, 900,000 cancer cases in a year. Now it's up you know, 1.3, 1.5 million cases. Mm -hmm. But the number of deaths has gone down, as you were just saying, even though we're seeing lots of cancer, we're seeing a lot more success. And there seems a couple of things that um, I'm hearing or reading that it seems that, and I don't know if it's about detection, but it seems like those under 50, there seems mm -hmm. to be an increase in the cancer. I don't know if that's as much lifestyle or what have you, but the detection there, um, a rise in, in cancer among adults over uh, under 50. Under 50, that is a recent phenomenon. Um, so there is a little mixture of good news. Cancer still isn't terribly common under 50. So when you, when you double the cancer rate of a small number, it's still a small number. Cancer is, is very much a disease of people my age in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But we are seeing an alarming uptick in the young people getting cancer. So when we look at the leading cause of death among um, adults, is cancer broadly defined? Is that number one in America? I'm, I wish I was prepared for that. I'm pretty oh. sure we're number two number after two. cardiovascular death and stroke. Well, and, and that makes sense as well. Is there a difference internationally in terms of where we are or, or relative to that kind? The, one of the things we do in this country is spend a lot of money on health care. Our, our gross domestic product percentage to something like 17 or 18 percent of all of our GDP is spent on health care. And, and we get a lot for that. But there's other countries that do just as well uh, with cancer care as we do. But in terms of technology and pharmaceuticals, the, the support medicines that we have, the support teams, uh, uh, America is, I think, unparalleled in the globe. When you uh, let's talk about a little bit um, about the maybe the top five or six cancers, um, what are the major kind of cancers today? It's it's pretty the big four: are breast, colon, lung, and prostate. So breast cancer in women, colorectal cancer, of course, in, in both, lung cancer, which is still a, largely tobacco-related, and then prostate cancer. But we're seeing melanomas rise up and pancreas rising up. The, the hematopoietic or blood diseases, uh, again, as we age, lymphomas, leukemias, myeloma. So in the top five or six, uh, those are those, those are the number one and through six and seven. So when we talk about um, cancer research. If we talk about disciplines, we know that there we can identify different disciplines. Are there certain categories or mm. specialties within cancer research? So, in broad stroke, there are clinical trials, which are therapies um, 
fighting a cancer in an individual person, and then there's translational research, which is looking at the disease process in terms of cellular DNA, not a, not a human being, but a particle below a, a human organism. So the two big camps are translational research, which occurs in, by PhDs and MDs and DOs, and then clinical research, where you're trying to apply those new thoughts to an actual person. Within cancer, there might be 20 subcategories. At Carillion, we have 10 different service lines wow. within cancer, from, from pediatrics to women's, the breast, to colon, to lung. So we, we form up along subservice lines with, with leadership, research, prevention, screening within each pillar. Wow. Well, so I asked about characterizing a little bit about the cancers are kind of where we are and if there are any trends. What would you characterize the state of cancer research mm. today in terms of a snapshot? How far have we become in terms of, and I guess you could say the detention uh, or uh, detection, treatment, and care? So in terms of detection, we are able to find now even subcellular particles of cancer inside the blood. I think 20 years ago I first heard of that and thought, well, that won't work. Well, it does. <laughs> DNA proteins are shed from these cells that are in our body and can be detected with a tube of blood. So the ability to detect cancer in its submicroscopic form is now here, real, and can be ordered. It's, it's really stunning. And um, what would you say in this detection treatment or mm -hmm. cure, and I'm going to get to that in a moment as a, as a word, but what do you think is the most exciting advancements mm -hmm. currently today? Wow. That's hard. So think about categories again. Yes. In surgery, I think the most exciting thing we're seeing is bigger surgeries and smaller holes, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Being able to take out a tumor and instead of a, a baseball-sized scar around your abdomen and into your thorax, you're, you're going into one or two ports with a Da Vinci robot and taking a tumor out with a quarter-inch incision. So in, in in surgery, the ability to do that with, with AI, with microscopes. I had a surgeon describing to me what it's like to do a pancreas surgery, old days versus new days. And he said, because well, I'm not a surgeon, and I didn't understand it, but when you go into the pancreas, it's, you go into the abdomen, and it's deep down in there. So the proctor, trying to teach the student how to get to it, he <coughs> got to try to lean up over and in and can hardly see what's going on. That's not what happens now with the new robotics. On the screen, which can be magnified 50 times, the proctor can say, no, no, go to the left, go to the right. No, no, oh, yeah, that's the right spot. It's just, it's a marvelous tool. In fact, if you think about it, you could be in another city watching that surgeon do something maybe he or she wasn't really used to and say, no, go to the left. No, no, that's not the right spot. So in surgery, the, the robot is changing everything. So we oftentimes hear about, and sometimes it's a fundraising thing, like give, help us to cure cancer. But that particular word, I mean, some cancers, as technology gets better, higher survival rate, longer survival rate, perhaps less percentage of recurring. But are, is, are we on the verge of like really curing, using that term in terms of some cancers? For sure, <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, if, if you go back to my, my early sure. days in the, in the 80s, um, we had just learned how to cure Hodgkin's disease, just learned how to cure testicular cancer. So in, in my era as a, as a wet behind the ear doc, it, it, some of my professors, if they saw Hodgkin's disease or testicle cancer, they remember those people dying of the cancer because there was no treatment. Well, in the 1980s, they discovered how to cure those cancers. And now routinely we can cure those cancers. Added to the list now are childhood ALL. Uh, well, really almost in every single cancer we've learned how to cure. The cure rates might be as low as 10%, but in testicular cancer, it's in the 90s. Wow. So we can cure cancers. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the funding for cancer mm. research. I guess in the past it had been more at the national or federal level, but now there's so much competition for federal dollars, as well, whether it's the military entitlements or what have you. Mm. 
when we see where the funding for the research goes, I guess you can never have too much. But what is it? Is, is the federal government still the primary? Um, it, it used to leader? be. So the National Cancer Institute is part of the National Institute of Health. Um, I just looked this up before I came to meet with you. A Seven billion dollar budget for the National Cancer Institute. I also looked to see, for instance, Bristol Myers Squibb will probably spend $15 billion in research and development. In, and so you, you have the, the national government with taxpayer funds, and then you've got uh, pharmaceutical companies who are, who are capitalistic by nature, and they want to find a blockbuster drug, and they're willing to put in research and development numbers that dwarf what the, the NCI is doing. Wow. But you can also, you can see a little disparity getting baked into that. If, if the taxpayers are funding it, the taxpayers can say, I think we need to do a little bit more research on this or this or this. Whereas within pharma, they're actually going to go after the, the, um, the shiniest object and, and go after the diseases that maybe have the highest rate of return and less research is seen in some of the rare malignancies. So, there's a balance right now. Mm -hmm. I don't think we spend enough um, in terms of our national budget, but seven billion's a lot. Yes, and um, and this may be a, a dated question itself, mm. um, but we used to hear that there could be either racial uh, or gender bias in the cancer in terms of the funding to try to find the cures for some of these. Do you see that is such glaring, or is there still some argument across some cancers? So that is a many-layered onion, but uh, historically we have, we have done some serious harm when it comes to disparities. Um, I would also say that now that the awareness for being diverse and equitable in how we invest the money and how we spend our healthcare dollars, it's front and center. And uh, I, I think at least at Carillion, if you come in the door sick, you're gonna get treated. Uh, and I see the same thing in our clinical research trials. We're not really looking to your own characteristics to put you in a trial. We wanna know what your tumor is. Mm. And what would you say is perhaps some of the greatest challenges for cancer research today? What, what confronts you as two or three or whatever of the greatest challenges that you confront in the cancer research? In, in research, I yes, think sir. we don't spend enough money in screening and prevention. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'd like to see a lot more money spent on is how, you know, I said, what, what do people want? Well, they don't want to get cancer in the first place. <laughs> so that's what prevention is. And next, if they do get cancer, they want it to be small or early. And that's what screening is trying to find that when it's early. What we see more often, especially coming out of COVID, is, is people not going to get their screening tests, not going to see their doctor, oh. and we had a lot more advanced cancers. So most of the clinical research has been in those advanced cancer states. And so I'd say that's one big challenge, is to try to move uh, education and screening and prevention into, to give more emphasis to those. Well, when we talk about challenges, we also flip it and say, what is the greatest opportunities mm. in terms of cancer research? So can, when, I, when I mentor the medical students, I say that oncology is still, it's the queen of the sciences because it's the, the juxtaposition of genetics and immunology. Our understanding of the body's response to viruses or malignancy, that is immunology, is exploding. And at the same time, our ability to understand the genetics of the cancer cell is exploding. And so this is why artificial intelligence is going to help my field so much is because there's 22,000 human genes and how many different variations you suppose there are on that. And immunologically, we have dozens of different uh, immune cells going around our bodies trying to find a cancer, even kill a cancer. And so how do we connect the genetic mistake with the right tumor immunocell? So in terms of opportunity, it's already coming. Immunotherapy is here, genetic therapies are here, but I think we're seeing the tip of an iceberg. So let's talk a little bit about two different things because, and let me start in terms of AI. You mentioned mm -hmm. the artificial mm -hmm. intelligence and we also know there's a difference between generative artificial intelligence. If we read in the popular press, 
there's all these legitimate so but concerns about AI itself whether it misinforms or mm -hmm. it's very good however are there some cautions say a little bit more about how AI specifically can help within the cancer arena and well, it, that's a long list but <laughs> but it, even 10 years ago the 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 data from all the radiology tests went from from film to digits. Every one of those digits is a piece of data. And the more data, the more AI get, can get smart. So the over-reading of x-rays and CAT scans by, a, by an artificial brain is, is here. It's here and now. In fact, um, we have a system that reads through the radiology reports. And I use this example all the time. If I have an MRI of the shoulder, and it says, and incidentally, a tiny nodule seen in the right upper lung. And I'm a, I'm a busy orthopedist, and I look at the shoulders, and that's all I pay attention to. Buried in the report, it says there's a little peripheral nodule. So we now have AI reading reports, and if the word pulmonary nodule comes up, it goes into a list. And then it tabulates incidental findings for, to prevent misses. So AI is, has been in radiology for some time. It'll be coming into the operating room soon to, to help with uh, mapping tumors as they get removed. Um, I think it'll answer questions of patients. When I think of the phone calls I took when I was on call during my past life, that could have been handled by a robot quite easily. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Jones. Um, I see you're on these drugs, and what is your problem today? And, and this isn't even a human. And oh, okay. Your temperature is 99 degrees? No, you don't need to come to the emergency room. You say it's 103. Okay, get in your car. And so AI, I can see a role for, for simple patient management. Imagine the phone being answered within one second of making the, you know, the phone call. If, if it's a pretty smart uh, robot, I'll, I'll talk to it. And so there is an important role, becoming more a central role for AI, broadly defined in a very positive and productive way. Can be. That, you know, the other side is the technology, and and I guess I was I had no idea that now you can have cardiac catheterizations. They don't necessarily use the leg; ninety some percent go in the arm, mm -hmm. and you just and and you figure, well, wait a minute, why, why did the and part of the technology, I guess, in the mechanical aspects, mm -hmm. is just getting so much uh, better. Yeah, there. The, I had it described to me that if I had a thyroid nodule and I didn't want a scar right here where it showed with the, with the robot, you can go in peripherally and tun tunnel over to the thyroid, because remember, you don't have to see it. It's being seen by a computer screen and remove it uh, out of your armpit. It's like, okay, then thought of that. <laughs> right, right, it's an amazing. Well, but now let's talk a little bit about the accessibility um, in terms of some of the current technologies. and. I mean, just recent, they say on the market they brought this uh, particular shot that will help in terms of dementia, it's giving out 22% uh, improvement delay or whatever, but mm -hmm. that was a statistic that was there. And you go down and you say it's $3,200 a shot. Mm -hmm. If you get a shot a month, you can do the math. Accessibility is still, even to get the latest in technologies and what have you, is that beyond the reach of most people? Is that still problematic in terms of access? So it's, it's if you have the right insurance, you can get almost anything. But insurers are now wisening up and they're saying, show me that data. Uh, did, it, did it stop dementia? Did it reverse dementia? Did it really get that person back from um, a, a place in their life where they weren't functional to a functional place? And so that's the whole notion of value. And, and the same thing in, in my field in oncology. If it improves your lifespan by a month, what is that worth? Mm -hmm. If it improves it by 10 years, what is that worth? If it cures testicle cancer, what would I pay for that? A lot. Mm -hmm. And we really haven't yet as a society learned how to grapple with value in medicine, mm -hmm. uh, like the dementia shot. If it reversed dementia and got me back to work, I think I'd pay a lot for that. If it just slowed down a process and didn't really change my outcome much, I, I'd say, what, what's my out of pocket? So we have to deal with that. And I was looking at some statistics on the federal budget and um, 
a million million is a trillion. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's 0.8 trillion in Medicare and 0.8 trillion in Medicaid. So if you look at the health programs that we're spending in the federal budget this year, it's, it's over a trillion. And just out of curiosity, I look back to when I entered medicine in 1980, <laughs> it was something like 60 billion wow. on Medicare and Medicaid. Not trillion, billion. So what's happened in 40 years is, has healthcare gotten better? Oh my goodness, yes, for sure. Did the, did the price go up in, at the same increment? No, <laughs> it actually went up quite a bit more. So if we have an opportunity in medicine going forward, it's trying to assign value so that the, the benefit and the price are somehow in a more parallel universe. And you said, and mentioning a word, and um, insurance. Mm -hmm. And insurance companies, and I don't wanna, I'm not gonna attack, <laughs> you know. And, they're uh, they're that, much that, needed. That's a separate show. Mm -hmm. Even though recently I've, I had to challenge an insurance particular decision, um, but that is real, and that can also discriminate in terms of depending upon mm -hmm. the insurance companies, and if they kind of fight some, and I know they don't want to waste money, right. but that, that itself is also kind of a challenging area, and frustrating perhaps for clinicians and others, no uh, because it's, they get part of the decision process. Yeah, that's a two-hour show. Well, we're <laughs> happy to come back. But what yeah. we have is a, t a tiered level of insurability. And so the government programs of Medicare and Medicaid, they're some of the most consistent ones because they're dictated by, you know, a body. Whereas in, in the commercial, um, I can write the smallest check possible and get the worst policy I can <laughs> get, or I can write the biggest check and get a Cadillac. So in the commercial side, there are gradations of insurance. And if you've bought a really inexpensive policy and you get sick, you might be shocked to know what's not covered in your plan. Right, right. Well, and the other thing, and, and I don't want to insult you or, or a Korean or anybody, but um, is there a disparity between the words? For some things, must I go to Chicago? Must I go to mm. New York? Or can I have confidence that in Roanoke, regardless of what it is, I can get very good state-of-the-art, whatever that means in terms of diagnostic care and treatment. Again, if you look at every single disease, we're not gonna be able to treat every single disease. But sure. within oncology, we're still sending out transplant and bone marrow transplant. Uh, we don't do that locally. But in terms of surgery, radiation, cyber knife, mm -hmm. all the chemotherapies, genetic, immunotherapies, they're, they're all done here regionally and you really don't have to travel. Now, as, as cancer progresses, and if I have a clinical trial for you in your relapse or even up front, wonderful. But if I don't have a trial, you can go online, cancer.gov, and see that that trial is at Wake Forest or it's UNC or it's up at Charlottesville. So you don't have to travel. And then there's people who just choose to. They say, I wanna go to fill in the blank, and off they go. Often they come back to us and say, well, we found out you can do that here. <laughs> right. Well, so um, what are some of the ethical challenges, if I put it that way, in terms of cancer research? And I guess that would be kind of the internal struggles. You've mentioned some um, a little bit earlier, but the ethical dimension of the cancer research, what are some of those struggles? So in, I believe, a a clinical trial should be offered whenever it's available. Mm -hmm. But w what am I saying when I say that? I, wanna, I want you to go into a trial in which you're most likely going to be compared to standard care, which is known to be effective, and this one might be better, but it might be worse, and we don't know. Obviously, I'm not offering it because I think it's going to be worse. I'm offering it because I think it's going to be better. And in the composite, people who go on clinical trials tend to live longer than people who don't. So clinical trials, I think, uh, it should be a conversation in cancer especially, but there's always the notion that you'll go on a trial and you'll get a therapy that either didn't work or harmed you. Uh, so, but again, that's part of the informed consent process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we only have a couple of minutes or so remaining, and I wanna give you an opportunity. Look into the future. What's out there for us in terms of 
curing cancer and cancer research. So there are so many things that we do uh, to our own bodies that we can stop and try to avoid cancer and to begin with. So, I mean, certainly tobacco, um, alcohol in moderation, diet and exercise, the vaccines that are uh, available that stop cancers from forming, uh, specifically the Gardasil, um, the human papillomavirus and for cervical cancer and uh, head and neck cancers. If we're going to see a, a wonderful thing happen in 10 or 20 years is the mandate for vaccinations for kids in the public schools in Virginia. Um, we're getting 70, 80, 90. Some school districts are 100% vaccination rates. Wow. What that'll mean in 10 or 20 years is, is we may see the end of certain kinds of cancers. So I would love to see us continue to be amazing in advanced cancer care, which we're gonna always have. But I can put myself out of business if we do the prevention and screening better. Well, you know, this has been so very interesting. I remember as a, as a teenager, or, or even just conscious, if, if someone came home or said, the big C word is what they said. Yeah. If I got cancer, yeah. and it was never a good thing. And usually it was a very sad thing indeed. But this has been so informative um, across the areas. Dr. Fintel, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. And as always, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.